to give you a uh, perspective on silicon photovoltaics. Uh, uh, undoubtedly, it's a very broad field, as you, as you well know. And so um, I've taken the liberty to uh, try to give you a bigger picture, uh, but, but perhaps also to give you uh, my perspective of where things are going. And of course, you will see, as part of that, uh, some of the research areas that we're attempting to, uh, to forge uh, in this uh, challenged, uh, challenged area. Uh, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to start with uh, perhaps uh, uh, some four uh, quote-unquote patented slides that I like to put up uh, in terms of the, uh, the bigger picture. And it's very nice uh, with the introduction uh, that we had this morning from Professor Lapierre that really establishes a very nice uh, 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 foundation for, for this uh, follow-up uh, presentation. And uh, I might also add that as I go through the talk, uh, you will certainly see that there will be uh, a certain amount of echoing of the basic principles that, uh, that he covered this morning very nicely. So um, perhaps uh, one of the greatest tw 21st century challenges is really sustainably uh, powering the, uh, the planet. And if you look at this slide, you see here some of the uh, statistics from a uh, very interesting paper by uh, Lewis and Nocera. Uh, this is somewhat dated, but still a lot of the rudimentary facts are still quite, uh, quite valid. And, and what you note here is that uh, the, the world population, we broke, I believe, 7 billion um, uh, not too long ago. Uh, and we're presumably on track to 9 billion and then towards 10 billion. And you see that it's beginning to saturate. Uh, and if you read some of the books by Edward O. Wilson, uh, you will see that uh, his theory on, on the saturation has to do with the continual uh, increase in the education of the population, right? and in particularly of both both sexes, and of course, people then uh, become far more, uh, far more selective in how large a family uh, they're going to have. Uh, quality of life, of course, becomes important. What's interesting to also note is that um, uh, we sit today around 15 terawatts in terms of energy consumption uh, annually, and uh, we're moving towards almost double uh, that uh, by 2050. And you will note that the population isn't doubling. But the energy consumption is certainly moving in that direction. And that's a reflection of uh, the continual uh, improvement in the, in the uh, quality of life that uh, uh, everyone strives for. Uh, and, then, uh, and then, of course, it doesn't quite double, uh, but it's still going up. And notice that the, the rate of population is not as, as, as large. Right? The other interesting statistic here to note is the, uh, uh, the CO2 emission you will see that the CO2 emission is also uh, rising, but it's not rising at, at the same rate. Right? And this is taking into account that we're going to become more and more carbon efficient with the range of uh, carbon intensive processes, not to mention that there is also a very significant drive towards uh, carbon neutral uh, technologies. Uh, I've got a few videos that I've highlighted. Obviously, I'm not going to show them because they're rather long videos. Uh, you may want to take note. Um, uh, this one is by Hans Ro Ro uh, Rosling uh, that uh, speaks to 200 countries, 200 years uh, in four minutes. A very interesting uh, video uh, that really shows uh, the, uh, the energy uh, production uh, and how the quality of life, and one measure of quality of life is the, is the human lifespan. Uh, so you know, you'd be surprised 200 years ago, the human lifespan uh, average maximum human lifespan was around 40 to 45, and that was in the Netherlands and the UK. Right? And of course, we've more than doubled that, and we of course have that uh, in many parts of the world today. This is an interesting uh, uh, slide here, which speaks to the uh, energy return on investment. Right? So energy return on investment is important. Um, and, uh, and of course, that's invariably related to financial uh, a rate of, a rate of uh, investment as well, a return on investment as well. But it's nice to look at it from an energy perspective. So you can see that um, uh, pumping oil out of the ground, right, you're going to perhaps burn a barrel and you'll get 25 to 30 times its energy value, right? And that's why in Canada uh, we have as small a PV community as we do uh, because it's very easy for us to simply dig and pump. Uh, U.S. crude oil, um, uh, you see, is around seven. Uh, the Canadian tar sands, uh, you know, it's, it's not that great. Right? It's, it's, it's up there uh, at the level of perhaps three or so. Uh, you can see grain ethanol, uh, soy diesel, not, not so great. Solar PV is uh, perhaps around uh, uh, 12 or so. Uh, diesel, uh, you can see, uh, is uh, uh, where you're liquefying a lot of the coal as well, is, is, is up there. And wind, of course, is excellent, right? And I'm told that 
Wind is uh, very popular because it has a lot of fans. Uh, but uh, uh, there is reason to believe that as we develop PV, we will power a lot of the fans. Uh, and hopefully, uh, you are, of course, the promoters uh, that bring out the fans. Um, so when, when you look at this, um, it's also interesting to, uh, to know that um, you know, what is the minimum threshold for an industrial society? Because um, you know, we talk about renewable energy, but on the other hand, right, we're using all sorts of other energy to process the silicon, right, uh, to, to make all these things. Uh, for example, I remember when the oil price was going up, uh, people said that, oh, this is just uh, this is great, now ethanol can compete. But then they found that they had to pay more to harvest the corn because all the tractors were running on oil. Right? And so it, it, it was a struggle. So it's not, not a simple matter. Although Brazil is a successful story, and there are reasons for that, uh, but I, I won't bother going, uh, going into that. So the question often is, you know, what, what, is, what is the minimum for an industri industrial society? Is it five to one? Uh, or is it, is it two to one? Uh, because once you establish that threshold, anything below that is not very meaningful to pursue uh, from an energetic perspective. Okay, this is yet, um, yet another slide. And this shows the energy flow uh, in quadrillions. That's 10 to the 15 BTU. Uh, so there are units. Uh, you may not be familiar with BTUs, but that doesn't matter. And what's interesting here is you can see uh, the various sources of energy and, and, and where it's coming from. And you can also see uh, that um, there is energy that is actually going into uh, delivering a useful uh, function. Right? Uh, so for example, in transportation, you see that uh, there are some 27 quadrillion units there. Uh, we get about seven units of useful energy where it actually delivers you from point A to point B. Uh, but about 20 units is actually lost into, uh, into waste heat. And so if you now look at the final numbers here, you see that there's some 55 units compared to 40 units. Right? 55 units are wasted, 40 units are utilized, if you look at the whole picture. Right? There's an enormous opportunity there as well as we move forward. OK, okay last, uh, last slide uh, in terms of the, these, uh, these overview slides. Is the, is the power of the sun. So there we are, 15 terawatts. Uh, that's the total estimated uh, non-renewable reserves, right? So clearly, this is going to keep us going for a while. Uh, oil is not going to disappear tomorrow, nor is, nor is uh, coal. There's lots of coal. You can see that 730 terawatt uh, years compared to 15 terawatt per year that we consume. Right? But, but certainly, uh, you see that this, of course, is an enormous potential, and it only behooves us to, uh, to tap that. Okay, what I'd like to, with that as a backdrop, I'd like to uh, start by uh, uh, giving you a uh, relatively quick uh, historical glance, then go on to fundamentals of sil uh, silicon PV, and there I'll perhaps uh, uh, go through it somewhat uh, quickly given the background that we already have, but perhaps highlighting some key points. Uh, and then I'd like to really spend uh, some time on high efficiency silicon PV cells and advanced silicon PV and where we see the potential in terms of uh, uh, transforming silicon uh, PV uh, into, into truly a, a ubiquitous uh, commodity. And then I'll close with the summary. So you know that uh, uh, it really started with the, uh, the uh, galvanic uh, effect where he was carrying out experiments with frogs. And as he made contacts uh, uh, to uh, the, uh, the nerves, he was able to get certain uh, muscles to twitch. And he felt that he uh, actually uh, had discovered animal electricity. And in fact, uh, uh, Volta was a rival of his. He even sent his uh, publication to him. And of course, uh, that was really a spur in Volta's flank because Volta realized that that just didn't, didn't make good sense. And of course, Volta went on and showed that what was happening in Galvani's experiment was that he had two dissimilar metals that were coming together via an electrolyte. Right? And the electrolyte was, of course, uh, that, uh, that animal body there. Right? And, and it was creating uh, that electrical impulse. And of course, that was the foundation for the electric battery, the voltaic pile, right, which was absolutely critical, uh, on which, of course, we relied for a whole host of things. Then comes Becquerel, who discovers the photo photovoltaic effect. Um, here's an individual, uh, son of a physicist, who's carrying out an electrochemical experiment. And he sees that upon uh, exposure to sunlight, there's increased activity uh, in the external circuit. 
And, and that really marks the beginning of the, of, uh, formally of the science of photovoltaics, not to suggest that someone else didn't discover it and wasn't recorded, or for one reason or another uh, was not given the credit, which of course uh, can happen. 1873, Smith uh, discovers uh, photoconductivity uh, in selenium, which was the basis for Fritz to go on in 1883 and really make the first uh, Schottky junction photovoltaic device uh, where he has selenium uh, on iron and a very thin layer, literally, of the order of nanometers thick uh, of gold uh, to make the first solar cell. And if you re read the paper, he, in fact, does say that someday this will, in fact, be a significant source of energy. 1940, Ohl, uh, in fact, develops the PN junction. So Ohl is really the first individual working at Bell Labs, uh, develops the PN uh, barrier junction, and uh, from that work, in fact, shows the first photovoltaic device. The efficiency of the first photovoltaic device was hardly a fraction uh, of a percent. And the basis for that, or the reason for that, was because the material was very, very impure. Uh, you can see uh, the amount of time that it took. Um, and then, of course, you have the multi multidisciplinary team of Chapin, Fuller, and Pearson coming together to show 6%. And, and that's uh, uh, chemist, engineer, and, uh, and physicist. So a lot has happened in the last 60 years. And I had thought about giving you a historical overview on what's happened in the last 60 years. And really, there's too much to cover. And so I thought perhaps uh, one slide that could attempt to encapsulate that would be the PV experience curve. And the PV experience curve is really uh, showing you the average module selling price uh, as a function of the cumulative module, uh, module sales. And you can see that the module prices are, were very high uh, in the early years. In fact, they were upwards of uh, as much as $70 to $100 uh, per watt. And you can see that they've steadily come down. And this has a slope of 80% uh, uh, or negative decimal eight. In other words, that there's a 20% decrease in price with every doubling of cumulative ins installation. Right? And, and you can see the projections really um, steadily moving down. So if you look at the prices today, and they're somewhat uh, perhaps artificially lower uh, because of the, uh, the enormous uh, inventory on the market, uh, the glut on, on, on the market. Uh, but cells are roughly around 60 cents per watt, if I recall correctly, um, uh, coming out of, uh, out of China. And um, if, if you look at this, you can see that it's quite conceivable on the basis of the cost of materials limit that it would, in fact, move to as low as 20 cents uh, per watt. Uh, and so that's uh, clearly uh, very, very compelling uh, when you think that today, uh, really what was considered to be the holy grail of a dollar per watt, we're there, but now the holy grail is a dollar per watt installed. And we're not quite there as far as that's concerned. OK, let's, uh, let's look at the fundamentals. Uh, so the electronic structure, you're quite familiar that you uh, have the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the discrete levels in an atom. And when you, of course, bring atoms together into a solid, uh, then you have this periodic uh, potential uh, well. And uh, indeed, that gives rise, uh, if you look at this one-dimensional single crystal, then that gives rise uh, to the uh, splitting of the levels and the formation of these bands. And so this diagram here shows you the energy levels for a one-dimensional eight-atom crystal. Right? And so you see here, uh, these are the S states that are more or less in the band. Of course, they're still discrete, but they're very close. Uh, and these are the uh, P-level states that are also forming a band. But also note that there are states in the band gap. Right? And these are the so-called TAM states or surface states. And because you're working with an eight-atom crystal, these states emerge by virtue of the boundary conditions that you would have to apply at the end of that crystal. Right? It's, it's not unlike uh, a silicon crystal that's, of course, quite, quite large. Right? And of course, these surface states play uh, in, an enormous role, as we've already heard uh, this morning. OK, the electronic band structure of silicon, you know uh, that it's uh, the diamond crystal structure where you have two interpenetrating FCC lattices. And of course, there's sp3 hybridization that occurs that gives rise to the so-called bonding and anti-bonding states, uh, or if you wish, the valence and the, uh, the conduction bands. And here, you see an EK diagram uh, that is shown in the 100 direction and the 111 direction. And what's important to note is that um, from this, you see that, in fact, uh, silicon is an indirect band gap material, right? where um, you, in fact, need a phonon-assisted transition to occur, uh, uh, for example, for the purposes of, uh, of absorption. And of course, that's the basis uh, 
for the uh, for the small uh, small uh, absorption coefficient, but that's also the basis for silicon uh, not being a good uh, emitter. Right? It's not a good light uh, light emitter. Looking at uh, silicon uh, conductivity, uh, you can see here that you have this tremendous range of being able to vary its conductivity. Right, literally. Uh, seven orders of magnitude very comfortably before you get into, uh, of course, a degenerate uh, semiconductor where your Fermi level is now going into the conduction band. And that gives you an enormous uh, range of, uh, of versatility in, in, in uh, drawing devices together. Here you see a chart that shows you the electron concentration uh, as a function of the inverse temperature. So the temperature is increasing this way. And so you see that uh, as you come up in temperature, you're coming out of the freeze out uh, zone, right? So you don't have uh, carriers there. And then of course, uh, you have uh, uh, carriers uh, that are relatively constant. And then of course, as you increase the temperature, then of course, you're beginning to uh, uh, create uh, carriers through thermal generation that becomes significant. So in this particular case, we're looking at a, at a silicon sample that is a no nominal dopant concentration of 10 to the 15, extrinsic do dopant concentration of 10 to the 15 which is roughly of the order of one ohm centimeter uh, resistivity. If you look at conductivity, on the other hand, uh, you will see that the conductivity uh, certainly comes up uh, steadily, more or less reflecting what's happening with the extrinsic concentration as you come up to temperature. But then uh, you can see that the conductivity begins to drop. Right? And of course, that's a reflection of the fact that conductivity is a function not only of the carrier density, but also of the mobility, right? And what you have here is that the mobility is dropping, right? There's a variation in the mobility, and the drop in mobility is, of course, a function of both the uh, uh, lattice uh, or phonon interaction uh, of the carriers, as well as uh, the impurity uh, scattering that occurs uh, as carriers propagate. So here, uh, we show the electron and hole mobilities uh, in silicon, uh, as you well know, the uh, electron mobility uh, is, of course, uh, almost uh, a factor of two to three larger than the hole mobility. And uh, here you see, for example, that as you move from a uh, extrinsic dopant concentration, and in, in, in this particular case, donor concentration for n-type material, from 10 to the 14 towards 10 to the 19, right, you see that the mobility is, in fact, dropping. And that's an impurity scattering effect. And then here on the inset, uh, you see uh, that as you increase the, uh, the temperature, uh, the, uh, the phonon scattering becomes important. In fact, that dominates in relation to impurity scattering. Right? So just the vibration of the lattice atoms, and as a result, the potential, the periodic potential is being disturbed. Right? And so the carriers now can't move uh, as, uh, as readily. And, and similarly for the, uh, for the whole mobility. Here uh, we show the uh, indirect band gap and direct band gap uh, uh, behavior. So we've already discussed this in the context of silicon, and I've contrasted that, contrasted that against uh, the other marcenite. And, and, and here, of course, uh, uh, this is simply repeating the, uh, the points made this morning. Uh, and of course, here you see the loss in energy due to, uh, due to thermalization. And uh, correspondingly, if you were to look at the absorption here, uh, here it's shown as the fraction of uh, above band gap light being absorbed, uh, you can see that you need to get with silicon to about 100 microns before the bulk of light can be absorbed, uh, whereas with uh, gallium arsenide, uh, of course, you're looking at, at uh, it being of the order of a micron uh, in thickness. This is again presented uh, in a similar manner, and we saw that this morning uh, as well, uh, and so I won't, uh, won't belabor uh, this point. Uh, the only thing that I would like to highlight here is that this is for silicon, and so you can see that the absorption is rising steadily as the wavelength decreases or the energy increases, right? So the absorption uh, is, is increasing there. You can see that photon energy is increasing this way, and wavelength is decreasing. But it's interesting, if you look at hydrogenated amorphous silicon, see how it goes up almost vertically up, right? And that's a reflection of hydrogenated amorphous silicon behaving uh, like a direct band gap material. And I'll speak to that a little bit, uh, little bit later. Okay, so the PN junction, we've seen that this morning. You're quite familiar with it, so I won't, uh, won't uh, uh, belabor this. Uh, we've also looked at the basic IV characteristics. Uh, here I've just shown you the uh, one diode model. 
I haven't presented here, but the two diode model is very important. Right? Uh, so if you're trying to model a PN junction, uh, the two diode model becomes very important because uh, the second diode really reflects as to what's happening uh, at the interface. There's significant recombination uh, that occurs at the interface, and those losses need to be uh, well represented, and so you need to really look at a two diode, uh, two -diode model. Modeling of silicon solar cells, uh, beyond the idea of working with these macroscopic uh, diode models, is really where you take uh, the continuity equations and the Poisson relationship, as well as the transport um, uh, current uh, density uh, expressions, and you really solve these in three dimensions for a given cell concept in Centaurus. Right? So it's a finite uh, um, uh, element uh, method, uh, and, and of course it becomes very important uh, to model the various aspects, and you need to increase your mesh size, you need to get the various properties. And, and this is a, indeed a complicated activity, uh, especially in the context of photovoltaics, uh, because there you need to also couple the light in. So how you're going to represent the light uh, is, is, is a key, because oftentimes uh, these, uh, uh, these codes have been really written uh, with the microelectronic industry in mind, and so the optical component is not as well addressed. And, and furthermore, as you begin to look at new uh, device structures, uh, then you will find that even there, there are limitations. And you need to uh, appropriately write a separate code and then integrate that into, into Centaurus. Uh, there's a very interesting review that came out last year uh, in Journal of Computational uh, Electronics, and I've, I've noted that there. Um, I can certainly provide you with a uh, range of references if you're interested. Uh, do mention to me at the end, because I uh, understand that these slides uh, cannot be distributed. Okay, so we heard this morning about generation and recombination, and I'd like to introduce a couple of uh, uh, key, uh, key parameters that are important when we're looking at, uh, at uh, solar cells, and then here, of course, in the context of silicon solar cells. And that is that um, you know that the, uh, uh, the uh, total uh, carrier concentration is your equilibrium carrier concentration plus the delta N, where you're looking at delta N, for example, for photogeneration. And so under steady state condition, uh, generation uh, minus recombination uh, will take the form of generation minus delta N over tau, where tau is the carrier lifetime. And under steady state conditions, you equate that to zero, and that gives you an expression uh, for the, um, the uh, lifetime uh, of the carriers in relation to a particular loss mechanism, or, or if you like, scattering mechanism. So the effective lifetime of a carrier is dictated by radiative losses, right? Carriers are disappearing, uh, uh, and there obviously there's a time constant associated with that, with Auger recombination. We heard about Auger uh, as one of the recombination mechanisms. The Shockley-Reed Hall, right, where you have these defect states that are occurring in the band gap, right? And that's, those are notorious, they actually dominate, and you can certainly see, uh, for example, here, how the uh, Shockley-Reed Hall uh, concentration dictates uh, the, uh, the lifetime uh, for uh, a semiconductor with uh, a range of uh, concentrations as shown here. And then last but not least, there's also the surface recombination, because after all, you're dealing uh, with, uh, for example, silicon in this case, which has a very nice periodic uh, crystal structure, but of course, uh, the crystal is terminated, and the surfaces play an enormous role, uh, particularly uh, as, the, as the wafers become, uh, become thinner. And so, uh, it's often that one will characterize the effective lifetime in terms of the bulk lifetime, and then uh, the uh, uh, surface uh, lifetime would be 1 over tau sub s, but we would typically show that as the surface recombination velocity denoted by s, SRV, uh, which has units of velocity of centimeters per second, uh, and then w is the wafer thickness uh, that comes into, into picture. And, and the last parameter that I'd like to introduce here, which is, which is important, is the uh, effective diffusion uh, length. And that's a function of the diffusivity of the carriers uh, times the effective lifetime. Right? So there's a, there's a relationship there. And so the point here that is being made with the diffusion length is that it's a 1 over E folding length. And so if you have a diffusion length, for example, of 10 microns, then really you need to have um, uh, a, a wafer that uh, cannot be much more than uh, perhaps three or four uh, microns uh, in, in thickness to completely collect uh, all those carriers, right, ideally. 
last but not least, in this context, uh, I've just shown you, uh, this is the so-called Einstein relationship that shows the relationship between the diffusivity and the, uh, the mobility, right? They're, they're actually related. As you know, diffusivity is a parameter that uh, uh, represents the, uh, the, the, the manner or the, the, how readily carriers uh, transport uh, based on concentration gradient, whereas mobility is based on the uh, gradient in potential. OK, so looking at, uh, at uh, device uh, efficiency, and uh, this really uh, uh, slide really uh, encapsulates the, uh, the parameters that we saw this morning, uh, the optical losses, uh, the recombination losses, uh, surface recombination, the energy loss due to, due to uh, uh, thermalization. And so uh, the, the drive, of course, is to be able to minimize all of these losses uh, in a given, given cell, uh, cell configuration. And so uh, you need to maximize optical absorption, uh, have good impurity control, have gathering where you actually remove uh, impurities through certain processes. Uh, passivation becomes important and, of course, ultimately carrier extraction. And what's important is carrier extraction potential. Right? So a good analogy there would be, imagine you have Niagara Falls, but it's hardly a trickle of water coming down. Right? So then that doesn't really help you. OK, the pearl cell, we saw that also this morning. And um, so I'm not sure if I should really uh, go over uh, this in any, any detail, uh, because we've already seen that this morning. Uh, but I'll perhaps uh, highlight the fact that uh, really, this cell does encapsulate a lot of the key features. Uh, there's no, no question about it. But what's also important to recognize here, which is a theme that I'd like to highlight as I, as, as I proceed with this, uh, this presentation this morning, is that a lot of the processing that is done here is high temperature processing. This is all uh, done at 800 degrees, 1,000 degrees, or thereabouts, right? Your thermal oxide is grown at high temperatures. You need to diffuse your dopant concentrations. Uh, and so that's something to, to certainly consider. So if you look at the pearl cell, it was at 24.7. Uh, but recently, as you know, uh, the, uh, the standard uh, of AM1.5 has changed. And so there's a little bit more light uh, at the two ends of the spectrum. And so that's gone up to 25%. Uh, they, there's also the so-called PERP cell, right, which is the passivated em emitter rear totally diffused. Right? And so the difference there is that in this particular case, they in fact diffuse the p-dopant uh, on the backside of the cell everywhere, but then locally, uh, they also had P plus, right? And, and locally they had a P plus there because they wanted to make sure that there was a high, uh, high uh, uh, fill factor. There was good only contact there where the current was being being collected. And it's interesting to see that the PERT cell was not far from the, the pearl cell, right? The 24.5, depending on the resistivity of the wafer uh, that you were dealing with, and and also the various processing uh, that went on. Uh, so you you can see that there's a fair amount of variability or flexibility in cell design, and yet, of course, you can uh, achieve uh, uh, very significant cell performance. I've highlighted here a, a particular uh, video where you can, in fact, see how solar cells are produced, uh, uh, a video by SunTech. OK, so that's, that's the pearl cell. Uh, in uh, parallel, at the same time, uh, there was a lot of uh, effort that went on, uh, and this was led by Swanson's group, and that was on the back contact cell. And so the fundamental approach here uh, was to place all of the contacts, i.e. the, I, the, uh, the P contacts and the N contacts on the back. And this was motivated by the fact that they wanted to remove the, uh, uh, the shadowing losses. But not only that. What it did was it gave them complete freedom to optically optimize the front surface and now optimize the electrical contacts and the collection on the backside. They were not limited to how big or small the, the electrodes could be on the backside. Right? And, and as a result, uh, they were, of course, able to, uh, to achieve very good cell performance. However, it's important to also note that in this particular uh, cell concept, as we heard this morning, uh, that there's a lot of generation that occurs at the front end of the cell. And so the silicon quality becomes very important vis-a-vis uh, -vis the thickness of the, of the cell because you need to be able to collect all the carriers uh, 
coming all the way to the back. And so your effective lifetime uh, becomes very important. Right? So the bulk lifetime of the material is important. And, and indeed, uh, they, have, uh, they have addressed this uh, over the years. The other interesting thing to also know is that there is a shift here in the cell uh, or the absorber type. It's based on an N-type silicon wafer as opposed to a P-type silicon wafer. Okay? So the, P, the, the motivation for P-type uh, silicon PV development was really because of the microelectronic world. And as PV was developing, the microelectronic world had scrap silicon, which was very good for PV. And of course, that was all P-type. And that was driven by the fact that the minority carriers there were electrons. And of course, you had high mobilities. And for electronics, that was important. However, on the PV side, what has happened is that the presence of oxygen and boron, boron being the, uh, the uh, P-type uh, P uh, dopant, gives rise to a boron-oxygen complex. And the boron-oxygen complex is formed under light irradiation and creates light-induced degradation within the silicon. So in fact, when you take P-type crystalline silicon wafers, you will see that they will typically undergo some drop in efficiency after they've been out in service uh, for a few hundred hours. Uh, and, then, and then they tend to stabilize. And that's related to the so-called boron oxygen complex. By going to an N-type crystalline silicon wafer, which in fact is the preferred uh, form of material for photovoltaics, uh, you actually do not have that. This is an interesting uh, variation uh, in uh, PV cell concepts. Uh, the so-called obliquely, ob obliquely evaporated contacts. Uh, and this is a metal insulator semiconductor concept. And, and the key point here is that um, the group out, out of ISFH in, in Hamlin in Germany have, in fact, configured a grooving technique of the front surface and then evaporating the contacts on the side. Right? So they've still got the contacts on the front side, but they have, in large measure, uh, reduced the, uh, the shadowing loss or the obscuration, right? And, and here you see um, how they, uh, in fact, position the, uh, the cells at an angle, and then they're evaporating the metal, and it just comes in, right? So you can see very good German engineering uh, at work here. Now, a paradigm shift occurs with, uh, with Sanyo. So, so Sanyo comes up with the so-called HIT cell, the amorphous crystalline silicon heterogen. And the key issue here is that the heterojunction cell is a low temperature cell. Right? All the synthesis work is done around 200 degrees to 300 degrees tops. So Sanyo also uses an n-type crystalline silicon absorber. But now what they do is they will deposit p-type amorphous silicon. And that p-type amorphous silicon is of the order of 5 to 10 nanometers uh, in their best cells. They will also place an intrinsic amorphous silicon layer in between. And the intrinsic layer is placed there in order to provide good interfacial passivation. Because the defect states are, of course, uh, killers as far as carrier collection is concerned. On the back side, once again, they use an intrinsic amorphous silicon layer. And they have an n-type uh, amorphous silicon layer in order, in order to create the, the back surface field. And furthermore, they use an ITO uh, coating on the front side uh, and on the back side. They can use other uh, transparent conducting oxides uh, so as to provide uh, the, uh, the lateral conductivity in order to collect the carriers at the, uh, at the grids. And, and of course, you now have a, a bifacial cell. And, and, and these cells have, in fact, uh, uh, obtained uh, very good, uh, very good uh, cell uh, cell performance. So, uh, if I recall correctly, the, the best cells that they've reported so far show an efficiency of 23%, uh, which is a 100 square centimeter cell, uh, showing very impressive open circuit voltages of 729 and JSC of 39.5, uh, fill factor of 80. Now, I don't know if you remember the numbers that I showed you for the pearl cell, but the pearl cell. Um, didn't have a voltage as high as this. It was, it was, it was up there. But the JSC in the pearl cell was larger. Right? And that's because you have amorphous silicon on the front surface. And even though it's as thin as it is, there is still parasitic absorption losses associated with the amorphous silicon. 
And there's also some parasitic absorption loss associated with the ITO, although the ITO is very good from a transparency point of view. Also, notice that the fill factor, there at 80%, right? In the pearl cells, uh, there was uh, a fill factor of 82% there. Okay? And this is a very good fill factor, but it also reflects the challenge of transport through that intrinsic layer. Right? It's, a, it's, it's, after all, a dielectric. But on the other hand, of course, they've taken it down to a very, very thin layer, down to probably less than 3 nanometers now. Uh, and of course, it, it acts as a, uh, as a tunneling barrier. The other interesting point about HIT cells is that if you look at the negative temperature coefficient, which is the drop in efficiency with every degree Celsius, for standard crystalline silicon solar cells, the negative temperature coefficient is around negative decimal 5, while for the HIT solar cells, you're approaching uh, negative decimal 2, which is comparable to amorphous silicon solar cells. And so this is, of course, a, a, a positive uh, a point uh, in terms of uh, uh, maximum uh, power uh, power uh, utilization or generation. There is also the so-called back contact heterojunction cell. And this has been proposed by several groups, including uh, our own group. And the idea here is to really combine the high efficiency con concepts of the back contact solar cell pioneered by Swanson uh, from SunPower and the heterojunction cell pioneered by Sanyo, uh, i.e. The, the HIT cell. And so here, the objective is to make a back contact cell that is, in fact, produced at about two or 300 degrees Celsius, as opposed to the 1,000 degrees Celsius that is done uh, with, the, uh, with the sun power cell. And the motivation for that is that it, by, by carrying out synthesis at low temperature, uh, it gives you a lot of versatility as you go into, uh, into manufacturing uh, of these cells, as well as enabling uh, you to move towards thin silicon wafers and ultimately uh, thin foils. So here is, is uh, an example of the box cell uh, where we've done some work uh, through some modeling and showing that uh, uh, if you have various uh, parameters that you optimize, uh, then in fact, uh, as you move the, uh, uh, the wafer to thinner and thinner levels, uh, it is possible to in fact uh, achieve efficiencies well into the 20% range, uh, so long as you have the light trapping uh, as well as the appropriate carrier collection. Okay, I'll skip this, uh, this slide. Okay, another cell concept is the uh, emitter wrap through cell. And so here uh, we see lasers being put to work. And so the idea here is to literally drill thousands of holes, uh, small <coughs> holes, into the uh, silicon wafer. And what you're going to do is you're going to then uh, diffuse uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, phosphorus doping uh, into the silicon as well as along uh, this path through, the, uh, through, the, uh, through this cavity uh, and all the way to the back. And, and by doing so, uh, first of all, you have small regions uh, with the emitter around it, right? And what you have essentially is you have the PN junction there. So the collection is much better, the recombination is lowered. In addition to that, you in fact place both contacts at the back. So you, you again reduce the shadowing losses. This particular concept was really developed with an idea to use low grade multi-crystalline silicon uh, and, uh, and really strive towards efficiencies uh, that go towards 20%. And indeed, uh, over 18% has, uh, has been achieved. The cell has also been extended to uh, uh, Chakralski silicon and efficiency is in excess of 21% have been obtained with the, uh, with the new uh, rat uh, cells. As you can see, uh, lasers are uh, used extensively in, uh, in uh, silicon uh, production as well as other uh, PV uh, production. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't highlight uh, the use of lasers to make what are referred to as laser-fired contacts, or LFC. And these are contacts that are made selectively on the back side where you make this back surface field, field contact. So for example, uh, you could have uh, an appropriate aluminum uh, film on the back side uh, deposited on a, uh, a passivating layer such as silicon nitride. And then locally, uh, you would have a laser pulse that would uh, cause the aluminum to diffuse uh, into the uh, P-type silicon wafer, forming a PP plus uh, junction there 
uh, and of course uh, that is also connected now to the entire silicon, uh, to the entire film of, uh, of aluminum, and thereby uh, you can of course have these localized contacts that doesn't destroy your passivation overall, but yet provides you with a path of extracting the current. And, and this has been developed uh, very, very nicely. And if you look at a lot of the papers, uh, for example, uh, from the work done uh, at uh, Fraunhofer, as well as uh, ISFH, you will see some excellent, uh, excellent results there. The other approach, uh, which is uh, still in the early stages, is the so-called laser-fired emitter, where you're, in fact, trying to make a PN junction. Um, and so here, the challenge is that uh, when you use a laser, in fact, there is laser-induced damage. And so you need to carry out various kinds of annealing processes in order to make the PN junction. But indeed, there's been some good progress that has been made. And you can see cells with different kinds of laser-fired emitter concepts showing efficiencies in the 11 to 15% uh, and, and, and somewhat higher range. And one of the objectives there is to now have a process which is, again, low temperature, albeit the laser processing is localized. And that's, of course, high temperature. So if you, if you look at where silicon is going, uh, because silicon clearly has been challenged uh, by uh, cadmium telluride. And, uh, and, and so as part of this, there is a drive to thinning the silicon wafer. So if you look at this roadmap, uh, it suggests that the silicon wafer will be down to about 100 microns by, uh, by 2020. And needless to say that there are a whole host of manufacturing challenges given the current mode of manufacturing on a 180 uh, to 200 micron wafer. Right? That, that, in fact, is um, fairly uh, uh, mechanically uh, uh, strong that it can withstand all the processing that's happening. And, and I know when I speak to colleagues where they're trying to move towards 160 microns, and there are challenges there right, with, the, with, with the equipment that they have. So you can, you can appreciate that there's going to be a challenge in moving uh, towards 100, uh, 100 microns. Needless, needless to say, there is a drive towards this uh, uh, in order to, of course, uh, increase the uh, utilization of silicon, reduce, of course, the material, uh, material costs. There are other reductions that are also uh, underway. And here, um, reducing the silver that is going into these cells. And in fact, there's a lot of work underway now where they're using copper. They're steadily moving away from silver. There have been a, there have been a number of developments uh, that have occurred in that context. There's also a drive towards moving towards silicon foils. Uh, and in this area, silicon genesis perhaps has been uh, a pioneer uh, where they have developed a process of producing silicon foils. These are 20 micron foils that are self-supporting. Right? So they're, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, they're about uh, probably uh, uh, 20 to 25 percent of the thickness of this paper. Right? I think paper is around 3 thou or something like that, which is 75. 100 microns. Which is, so it's absolutely remarkable when you think about that. And the way that they do that is they use an accelerated um, uh, proton beam. And uh, the proton, the range of the protons is directly related to the energy with which they're coming in. And as they deposit their energy, as they're slowing down, they break the bonds. And this is done at a particular temperature. And then they can literally cleave uh, the entire wafer. Right? And, and what you see here are, in fact, examples of foils uh, literally 156 millimeters square. And so they recently, in fact, in March, uh, uh, announced their second generation so-called Polymex uh, production system. Other players are Twin Creeks. Uh, they have a process called pro proton-induced uh, exfoliation. Uh, and then there is uh, IMAC, which has a uh, so-called slim cut uh, process. How many minutes do I have? Uh, what time? 15 minutes? Yeah, 15 to 20. I think we started at quarter past. We started quarter, quarter past? OK, thank you. So you can, you can see that uh, with the incorporation of uh, light trapping, uh, with the incorporation of low temperature synthesis, uh, and you could see from some of the results that I showed uh, in, in the in the context of the uh, back contact uh, amorphous cell, the so-called box cell, but there are other cell concept variations, that it, in fact, is conceivable to move towards what I call a 2020 PV vision that is greater than 20% on less than 20 microns. 
right? And hopefully before 2020, which is the uh, roadmap, okay? And maybe at 20 cents per watt, okay? Okay, so that, that's, that's a, a, a vision. Here you can see that Twin Creeks is saying that they can do uh, perhaps less than 40 cents per watt. What you see there is a um, 20 micron foil on which I believe they've achieved 14% using standard uh, thermal diffusion techniques. Okay, let's take a few minutes and talk about uh, amorphous silicon because clearly that's uh, that's part of silicon. Yes, Nadine. Sorry, before we move to the next part, um, how does this thin thickness, like, uh, like, it's very thin, right? Like, how does the absorption, like, they, they can reach uh, that sort of a performance? Here that so, so uh, probably through the combination of a certain kind of uh, anti reflective coating on the front, I would imagine that they must have had some form of texturization. Uh, they'll also have a, a, a back reflector. Uh, maybe they've grooved their back surface. So they've probably done various, various things uh, in, in that context. But, but you, you can bring in, uh, no, no doubt, uh, various light trapping uh, techniques. Uh, so for example, uh, some of the work that we've done with the inverted pyramids, uh, and, and at this point you need to now do wave optical uh, analysis and uh, with the inverted pyramids as one example where if you move towards something like uh, 500 nanometers or, or thereabouts and, and, and wafer thicknesses are of the order of 10 or 20 microns, uh, you can in fact have these uh, diffractive modes that in fact traps the light very effectively. And then on top of that, you can still add a uh, back reflector and hopefully I'll get a chance to speak about that using certain kinds of photonic crystals that are well tuned. So you, you, you can, in fact, uh, drive them. That's actually a very interesting question, and I, and I didn't mention that. Um, and that is that it's actually very nice, I think, to work with these foils, because they're no longer brittle. Right? You can, so yes, you have to deal with how you're going to heat them, how you're going to have uniform temperature over them. Right? No, uh, in, indeed, you need to do that. but. Uh, but you don't have the breakage issues that you currently have as you're making a transition towards 100 micron. There's a certain thickness when you get be below that, right? then, then in fact it becomes very, very flexible. Uh, and so this in fact really opens up uh, the era of um, uh, rollable PV. Right? So you can just carry this in a knapsack and then pitch a tent somewhere. Right? Okay. Okay, amorphous silicon. So we need, we need to spend a few minutes and, and, and talk about uh, uh, amorphous silicon because clearly it's, it's part of silicon PV. And, and amorphous silicon uh, clearly uh, hasn't uh, come up to the expectations, uh, the theoretical projection right, in terms of high efficiency with a very, very uh, thin silicon material. Uh, and, and that's uh, for a variety of reasons. So uh, first of all, if you look at the density of states in amorphous silicon, you find that there's a large density of states in the mid gap because amorphous silicon is a random uh, network. Right? And so there are all these dangling bonds. Right? So remember, we talked about dangling bonds in crystalline silicon at the surface principally. But here, it's actually within the material. Right? Because it's, it's amorphous, there's no long range order. There's only short range order. Uh, and so that was really overcome by hydrogenating amorphous silicon, by literally uh, having that hydrogen passivating the dangling bond. So you can have hydrogen concentration uh, on average anywhere from 10 to 20 percent, maybe in tighter films at 5 or 6 percent. And, and that hydrogen passivates the material and significantly drops the, uh, uh, the defect density in the mid gap. And now you're able to dope the material. And this was the key that really opened up this large area de deposition that of course is central in terms of these large displays uh, that we use. Uh, now extensively. Also, you will notice that because of the disorder, because of the variation of the bond lengths and the bond angle variation, you have these tail states. Right? So for example, this dashed line represents the density of states for crystalline silicon. Right? Whereas this is the density of states for morphous silicon. So you have these tail states. And these tail states uh, of course, uh, play a, a very important uh, role in terms of the, uh, the properties and affecting the transport uh, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of the material. And so typically, uh, if you look at the mobility in amorphous silicon, uh, it'll be of the order of a few um, 
uh, centimeters squared per volt per second, perhaps uh, one, one to five uh, or thereabouts, whereas, of course, in crystalline silicon, you're lo literally looking at values that are hundreds uh, uh, times larger. And, and you can see, uh, for example, the Anderson model, you can see here the potential well in the crystal structure, and you can see the amorphous, right? And so it's, it's clearly uh, uh, related to the, to the disorder, and here you have the disorder potential. And so the transport mechanisms are indeed uh, different, where you have indeed extended state conduction, but you, of course, have a lot of band tail conduction or hopping uh, that occurs. So here, um, what I have shown is um, uh, one, uh, one cell concept, uh, and this is the so-called dual junction uh, thin film silicon cell concept, where you have the amorphous silicon cell on the top, and that's a PIN junction. So the way that this works is that you have a very thin p-doped amorphous silicon layer that's of the order of 10 nanometers. Then the intrinsic layer will be of the order of perhaps anywhere from 100 to 300 nanometers typically. And then the n-doped region might be perhaps 10 or 20 nanometers. Right, so this, this, in fact, is your PIN amorphous silicon solar cell. And of course, you can have a single junction solar cell that operates at anywhere from perhaps 5 uh, to 7 percent. Uh, Certainly efficiencies, I think upward of 9% have been reported for single junction cells. Um, but of course, as you move towards dual junction, then the material here in the uh, cell below the amorphous cell is the so-called microcrystalline cell. And this is grown by high hydrogen dilution. And you can, in fact, have literally crystalline character there, except that it's microcrystalline because there are literally nanocrystallites uh, dispersed in an amorphous network. And if you look at the band gap of this material, it is, in fact, around 1.1 uh, eV, whereas the band gap of uh, amorphous silicon is typically around 1.7, 1.8 eV. Uh, and so with this, of course, you can create now a cell that can move you towards higher efficiencies. I might also mention that there has indeed been work done, uh, a fair amount of work uh, done in triple junction solar cells where they have showed uh, very high uh, efficiencies, uh, unstabilized efficiencies in any case. The challenge with amorphous silicon is the so-called Stabler-Ronsky effect. Upon exposure to light, there is a significant uh, light-induced degradation that occurs uh, in the intrinsic material uh, that, that increases the defect uh, density and thereby um, mitigates uh, carrier collection. Uh, and so uh, one approach that is taken uh, is to attempt to thin the intrinsic amorphous silicon uh, to as thin a level as possible. Uh, the challenge there is that as you thin it, you now have to work with uh, improved uh, light trapping uh, techniques. Uh, and, and of course, that becomes a challenge. The, the other thing that I would also mention here is that in the early years when we had these, this dual junction cell, basically there was a tunneling contact between the N-doped amorphous silicon and the, uh, the P-doped microcrystalline. Uh, but subsequently, uh, the uh, zinc oxide intermediate uh, reflector was proposed, uh, which provided uh, the, uh, the contact that was necessary between the two cells, but also now provided you uh, with that intermediate reflector property that, in fact, enabled to increase the current in the upper cell. Because typically, you know, in these dual junction cells, the cell performance is limited uh, by the, the current of the upper cell. The lower cell typically has a very, very high uh, uh, current density. And so I would like to use that as a segue to talk about photonic crystals. And as you can well imagine, there are a whole host of uh, novel techniques that are being explored uh, in the context of PV. And I'd like to highlight uh, photonic crystals here. Uh, photonic crystals are basically periodically modulated refractive index materials, uh, and you can liken them to being the uh, semiconductors uh, for light. And it really goes back to 1887 when Lord Raleigh was studying certain crystals that had twinning planes. And he, he saw that, in fact, uh, as he propagated light through these materials, by virtue of the twinning planes, there was a change in the, um, uh, in the dielectric uh, of the material and that was the consonant material and as a result you could see that certain uh, wavelengths of light uh, would actually propagate through and others would not. And, and, and of course there was a lot of work that followed uh, in the context of one dimensional uh, so-called Bragg stacks. And it wasn't until 1987 when Yablonovich and, and, and John uh, in fact uh, did a lot of theoretical work and extended that idea to three dimensions 
and propose uh, the so-called uh, photonic crystal, uh, where you can, in fact, have a photonic band gap in three dimensions, right? as opposed to simply uh, in one dimension, uh, which, of course, was introduced by, by Lord Rayleigh. And these are examples of photonic crystals that occur uh, in, uh, in nature. And so this here is the 21% uh, uh, omnidirectional photonic band gap uh, that is shown uh, when you have a photonic crystal consisting of alternating uh, stacks of slabs with uh, two-dimensional uh, two periodic uh, holes and rods. And of course, you can get fairly, uh, fairly sophisticated uh, with these uh, structures. And I'll speak briefly about that. So if you, if you now look at photonic crystals and ask the question, well, how can we use these in, photo in, in photovoltaics? So one, one property of photonic crystals is the so-called photonic band gap, or the stop gap, if it's, if it's not a three-dimensional uh, band gap. And, and what that means is that it will not permit certain wavelength uh, of light to, in fact, propagate. So you could actually use it as a back reflector. Right? It's a well-tuned back reflector that can, for example, reflect the infrared part of the spectrum. Um, alternatively, you could also use it as an intermediate reflector in a dual junction or a multi-junction cell to, in fact, uh, effectively modulate uh, the flow of light through the structure. Another possibility is to, in fact, make a photovoltaic absorber out, a, out of a photonic crystal, literally make a photonic crystal architecture. Uh, and what you're trying to do there is you're trying to use the so-called slow photon effect. Right? So if you look at these bands here, they're relatively flat. And what, what that represents is that the group velocity of the light is actually fairly low. Uh, and hence, the, uh, the, uh, the time that the light is spending within the structure is far uh, enhanced. And thereby, the probability of absorption is correspondingly enhanced. And so here, uh, you see a particular structure where we have what is known as anomalous refraction or parallel interface refraction. And so here, uh, and, and more recently, there's an interesting paper uh, by Sajeev John where they take silicon and they will um, create a photonic crystal by drilling a hole in the silicon, but the hole diameter is varying as you go down the silicon. And they've shown that you can be a thickness is probably of the order of a micron. Uh, and you can have very uh, large uh, parallel interface refractions. So light's coming in, and it'll literally make a 90 degree turn. Right? And, and as a result, of course, you can have significant uh, enhanced absorption. Uh, of course, uh, this now complicates the, the, the fabrication, but of course, those are details uh, that uh, you as researchers would attempt to, uh, to address. Here, I'd like to uh, highlight uh, the uh, potential applications uh, of, uh, of these uh, two, uh, two possible uh, avenues. Uh, so here we have the, uh, the dual junction thin film silicon PV. I mentioned to you where the, uh, uh, the intermediate reflector was simply a thin transparent conducting oxide. Uh, you can also use an inverted zinc oxide uh, opaline photonic crystal. Uh, or you can use a one-dimensional, selectively transparent and conducting uh, photonic crystal. And uh, if you go through the analysis here, uh, you see about an 8% enhancement here. Uh, you see a 20% enhancement here. Uh, you do see enhancement here, uh, although there have been a lot of challenges, uh, it appears, in <coughs> synthesizing uh, these uh, structures. And not only that, uh, with the inverted opaline structure, the structure is relatively thick, and so you, in fact, have uh, parasitic losses that are associated uh, with, the, uh, with the conducting dielectric here. But nonetheless, these are very uh, uh, promising approaches uh, that uh, could potentially see uh, the ability to reduce the intr intrinsic amorphous silicon thickness further, thereby uh, mitigating the state of the effect while uh, enhancing the absorption uh, and, and, and getting higher stabilized efficiencies and perhaps moving uh, towards the 15% uh, uh, stabilized uh, thin film silicon uh, PV uh, um, target. Okay, so uh, I won't spend time here because I think we're running uh, a little bit uh, short. Um, this is a, uh, an example of a photonic crystal uh, architecture in silicon. And what, what we have here is this is a standard silicon solar cell design, right? So you've got crystalline silicon here, you have an anti-reflective coating, 
And uh, on the back side, you have an appropriate uh, grating-like structure uh, with, uh, with the back reflector. And as an alternative, here we have a two-dimensional photonic crystal. So basically, we've taken the same quantity of silicon. Right? So in one case, we have two microns of silicon. In another case, we have 10 microns of silicon. And we've simply transformed it into a two-dimensional photonic crystal, which is nothing more than a pattern of these uh, 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 square uh, rods that are distributed. And then we have appropriate uh, coupler, uh, that coupling that you need in order to couple the light into the photonic crystal. And then uh, we have uh, a similar grating uh, at the back. And if you carry out uh, a detailed uh, wave optical analysis of this, you can in fact show that the best conventional design uh, for a two micron thin crystalline silicon gives you 18, a little over 18%. Uh, uh, whereas this one gives you over 20%. And so that shows you the, uh, the potential there. Now, you might argue that the increase is not enormous, and, it, and it's, it's about 10%. Uh, but it certainly shows you the importance of, uh, of light trapping features and, and really looking at the, uh, the wave optics that is occurring as one gets down uh, to these uh, levels of silicon thickness. Obviously, uh, there are a whole host of uh, silicon uh, PV uh, uh, concepts uh, that have been pursued and are being pursued, and, and uh, um, it's difficult to cover them all, but perhaps we can highlight uh, some of them. Plasmonics is an area that you've heard a little bit of, about uh, this week uh, uh, at the conference. Metamaterials, uh, right, the ability to curve light, can we uh, exploit that in the context of PV? Uh, silicon quantum dots, right, uh, uh, not dissimilar from the uh, uh, the lead uh, sulfide quantum dot uh, uh, work that we heard about earlier, silicon nanowires, uh, uh, silicon uh, as part of the 3-5 uh, family, um, silicon oxide, face out silicon oxide, MIM nanorectennas harvesting EM radiation directly. Uh, simply uh, think about that uh, you can, in fact, take microwave frequency and you can convert that directly into electrical energy at 80% efficiency. Well, can we do that with ambient energy? Because if you look at the ambient energy on average, it's predominantly thermal radiation, right? which is available at night. Right? There's enormous amount of 300 degrees C or that terahertz frequency light. If we can actually convert that. So there's a major terahertz challenge, and there's a lot of work uh, that's going on looking at nanorectennas. And certainly silicon oxide is, is part of the material that's playing a role uh, there. Uh, Upconversion, uh, silicon PV, silicon organic hybrids, uh, silicon photovoltaic thermal integrations, uh, silicon nanostructure transparent PV, uh, which we also heard about uh, earlier, uh, earlier today. And so in summary, uh, silicon uh, clearly is uh, a compelling material. It's the second most abundant element. Uh, it's environmentally compatible. I guess I spelled that incorrectly. I must have been drinking. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's an established uh, industry. Uh, but it, uh, notwithstanding that it's dominant contributor, it has been challenged by low-cost uh, thin film PV, right? Uh, CAD-TEL appearing on the scene has been very good for silicon, right? It's, it's uh, pushing silicon to invent itself, to reinvent itself, right? It constantly comes up with rabbits out of the hat, and, 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 and we certainly see that. And, and so uh, that certainly uh, bodes, in my opinion, uh, very favorably for silicon, and we certainly see it as being, uh, in the long term, a low-cost, low high-efficiency silicon PV provider. Uh, and indeed uh, becoming a ubiquitous commodity. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Matthew. Uh, maybe we have time for one or two quick questions. Everybody happy? Uh, I think there's a question here. Okay, so let me, let me try to answer that question. Um, if, if, you, if you look at, for example, sun power as an example, 
right? You see there that uh, they need high quality material just by virtue of their cell concept, right? Uh, and so they have focused on, on getting high quality silicon. And, and of course, they've had the benefit of Cypress uh, that has been a significant benefactor as SunPower came online. But what's particularly impressive to me uh, is, is uh, when you look at their production data, right, you see a very narrow distribution in efficiency output. Right? So you see an average efficiency of 22%, and it, it, you know, the sigmas are very small. Right? Whereas you look at a lot of the other manufacturers, and they've got all these bins. Right? It's a huge, huge distribution. And that's a reflection of where they're really coming to it from a low quality material perspective. And, and so invariably, uh, you, you, you do take a hit. Uh, and, and perhaps also in part, they haven't uh, uh, really uh, uh, got the processes as fine-tuned, although I think uh, you know, enormous strides have been, have been made. So uh, most recently, I was looking at some of the SunTech data. Right? And, and they've been using the so-called Pluto process, where they've tried to incorporate some of the uh, features out of the, out of the pearl cell, or at least uh, some of the advanced uh, ideas uh, from there. And you know, they report a highest efficiency of uh, greater than 19%, uh, but, but you know that the average distribution is, isn't there. So when I look at, look at that, and then I look at the Sanyo results, uh, the Sanyo results also, you know, the, uh, on average, you can see that this, uh, the cell performance is around over 19%. They're not into the 20s like SunPower. So that speaks to that really silicon quality is important. Uh, I, I think all of, the, all, all of those features have to, have to come together if you're going to have um, truly a low-cost PV. But, and, and what that means is that we also have to get the material reduction. Right? And so if we can reduce the material quantity by a factor of 10 by virtue of going, let's say, from 200 microns to 20 microns, still maintain over 20%. Okay? In addition, we overcome the curf losses. Right? Because every time you cut a wafer, you're losing, say, 140 microns. Right? So all of a sudden, you're now getting um, uh, a lot of benefits there. And then low temperature, I think, is, is compelling because you can do various things, you know, such as inkjet, uh, you know, all sorts of spray processes. And also, you do not exacerbate any further the, the material quality that you, you, you achieved up to that point. Right? So, so I, th I, think, I think there are advantages there. So I think that there will be a transition towards uh, this ultra-thin silicon foil direction. It's going to take some time. And the reason it's going to take some time, among other reasons, is, is not only the fact that it'll, it'll take time to, to realize all of that, but you have this enormous established industry base now right, that is riding uh, on a 180 uh, micron platform, trying to move towards 100 microns. And of course, they don't want to spend uh, you know, gazillions uh, of dollars to replace all of that right away, right? So, but in my, in, in my view, um, uh, certainly silicon foil is the way. Low temperature synthesis, I think, is compelling. Uh, but I would not discount, uh, uh, indeed, uh, high temperature processing. And the reason I say that is because I can see that you could come up with a thin foil technique. And you could, uh, for example, uh, have a very simple passivation procedure. So that could be one step. You now. Uh, literally right on the structure, put it in the oven, and the cell is ready. Right. So, so, so that, that's very conceivable uh, as well. So it, there could be an admixture of a range of uh, techniques there. Okay. So pardon me for uh, rambling, but hopefully I answered your question. <laughs> I think that, that was meant for me, not for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to ask, uh, you talked a little bit about stable Rowski and they try to overcome it by thinning the amorphous silicon. How does Unisolar, which sells amorphous silicon panels, how do they you know, turn a profit? How do they overcome that? Do they just wait for it to stabilize and then sell the panel? Or how do they overcome that? Or is it a trade secret? It's like black magic. So uh, Unisolar has gone bankrupt. <laughs> okay, but, <laughs> but, 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 <laughs> but, but let me give a slightly uh, longer answer. Um, so they, they had a triple junction, uh, and, and they actually had a very, very neat, uh, uh, I think, uh, concept. 
Um, they, they had amorphous silicon, then they would add a little bit of germanium that would reduce the band gap, then they would add a little more ger germanium, and sometimes on the front side they could even add carbon to increase the, the band gap. Uh, so some of the challenges uh, in that cell structure was that the germanium incorporation rate was very low when you were depositing these stones. Uh, and so uh, and germanium was very expensive, so that was one part. The other part was that in the lab, they showed some very high stabilized efficiency. But when they went to production, the production rates had to be sufficiently high because you had to produce enough megawatts. And so they, they had to uh, make a compromise and they said, okay, we'll increase the deposition rates. But as you increase the deposition rates of the amorphous silicon films, the quality of the films went down and therefore the, the, uh, the device performance went down. Right? So when I speak to some of my colleagues, and Yves Poisson is not here, but he tells me that uh, you know, uh, they've had triple junction solar cells and they get 7% uh, efficiency uh, out of those. And, uh, well, there are probably a variety of factors, but perhaps that was part of it. Okay, so um, thank you very much. Thank uh, you.